Um, so before we get to the whole panel, I would like to introduce a personal hero of mine and probably a lot of people here, Nolan Bushnell. He's the founder of Atari, Chuck E. Cheese, U-Wink, and tons of other amazing companies. He also hired two um, uh, of the founders of Apple. Um, so if you have an iPhone or an Apple computer, um, those guys started at Atari. And he's written a book about finding the next Steve Jobs. And um, I'll give him, yes, and it is for sale here. Here you go. Well, I guess the, the issue for me today is, what's tomorrow? And the book is really about creativity, which I believe is, in fact, the key to the future. Because what we have to do is we have to invent the future every day to make our lives better and faster and, and funner and more interesting and to really evolve our species as well as our lives into something that is different and more interesting. So my book really talks about the, in, the creative ecosystem. And I use Steve Jobs because he came back from, to Apple after being fired by the suits. And you know what they said when they fired him? You do too many crazy projects. <laughs> OK. They drove the company into the ground. In a desperation move, they brought Steve back. In a very short time, through creative movements, over and over, excellent designs, he created the largest market cap company in the world. I think it's down to where somebody, uh, I guess Standard Oil is bigger now, but think of the power of creativity. And that's really what we have. You can take your struggling little crappy company and turn it into the next Apple computer. You just have to be creative. And that's kind of the message that I wanted to give. But also, remember that business processes are also important. And this guy, Tim Sanders, is one of the smartest people I know. And I feel like I've been a constant student for the last year and a half. Because I met Tim and said, hey, I'm writing a book. And I'd written, at that time, a really bad science fiction book. Um, but it had sex every 30 pages. Yeah, it had sex every 30 pages, which I thought was really cool. And, and since science fiction really liked, uh, you know, the whole idea of having sex every 30 pages. Anyway, but, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he said, Nolan, you really need to write a book about some of your experiences and about creativity. And he basically put my team together with his new system. And what he's done is he's taken the publishing and book writing process and turned it into a startup. Well, hey, I feel comfortable with that. That works for me. And I can tell you right now that this book would not exist without this man and his system that I love dearly. So I don't know, how long do you want me to wax on here? Oh, to talk about that, give him one of the Pongs. What, what Pong do you want to share with him? The book has got a bunch of great chapters called Pongs. Which one do you want to share with him tonight? I think the most important Pong is to act. Act, act, act. Just do it. Because if you really look at the power of Steve Jobs, is he was an actor. He acted on everything. He impinged on his environment. And, and believe it or not, some of Steve Jobs' products are really crappy. <laughs> you know? We forget about it. Does anybody remember the Lisa? <laughs> A real stinker. Um, the next computer had some interesting software. It was pretty. And it was pretty, it was pretty. but it didn't compute. You know, I mean, you know, it, it, was, it, it was slow, it was sluggish, it was overpriced. It was a failure. 
it would have it would have been in the trash heap of history if he hadn't sold it to Apple, so that Apple could extract extract some of the the operating environment, because the Apple software was in the trash heap at that time as well. So, you know, the idea of being willing to fail is really key. So, not acting because you're afraid to fail, shame on you. You will not learn how to ski if you don't fall down. You will not learn how to run a business if you don't screw up once in a while. I mean, I lost $28 million doing a personal robot. I ran into the wall, a brick concrete wall with spikes in it at full speed. It hurt a lot. I mean, a lot of people think I'm richer than I am, but, not because of, but, but, but I'm not because of that. Anyway, so it, did my life change much? No. Am I probably a nicer guy than I would have been if I'd have been all arrogant and everything? Yeah. <laughs> I think my kids like me better, and <laughs> my wife definitely does. And so, you know, think of life as a journey. Be an existentialist. We know what our destination is. We're going to die someday. So you've got to really enjoy the journey. And that journey is full of ups and downs. And you know, when you play a game of chess and lose, do you go home and cry? No, you set them up again and go again, go at it again. And that's really what you have to learn about entrepreneurship. Go for it. Give it your best try. Make it happen. And sometimes, pull the plug. So. Well, there you go. Yeah, so that, oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> awesome advice. Definitely everyone here, you have to just go for it. Now we have a panel where our panelists are going to help you uh, find ways to go for it with uh, creating your own publications, whether it's books, online magazines, cookbooks. Um, Moderating the panel is Marsha Collier. Um, many of you know her because she seems to be everywhere. Um, how many dummies books? 40 something dummies books? I've, I've lost count. What's yeah. Just dummies books, hardcovers, whatever. I've, yeah, I've eBay for dummies, starting a, an eBay business for dummies, social media commerce for dummies, Facebook and Twitter for seniors for dummies, the ultimate um, online consumer service guide. Um, she's, she has a radio show. She's, um, you're on now on a panel. Giga-Ohm. Giga -ohm. Giga so she's an analyst on, for the pro Giga-Ohm. So, um, I, you know, I can't think of a better person to moderate. Okay, here she is. Thank you, Steve. I, 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 but, but I'm offended that she's now doing, you know, a, a panel discussion with dummies. <laughs> we have no boundaries today. Thank you all for coming here. Um, I'm very excited about this panel because each of these, I mean, Nolan is epic, right? I mean, we all know, like, he invented the world, right? But these two other people and that gentleman at the end each have their own unique special talents that I really respect and I'd like to share with you. This is Mark Jeffrey. I've known him for ages. He's a serial entrepreneur of innovative technology companies. Um, first. His first innovation was the Palace, which sold to Communities.com in 1998. Zero Degrees, which sold to Interactive Corp slash IAC in 2004. He was with Mahalo, uh, founding CTO, um, now Inside.com. Mark started a video series, This Week in Web Television Network. I was one of his guests, um, and that featured authors. He's authored five books, including the Max Quick series, which is published by HarperCollins. Mark's first novel, Max Quick, The Pocket and the Pendant, was originally a podcast. Mark put it up as a podcast and received over 2.5 million downloads in 2005. That, that's kind of epic. 2.5 million, anybody will go for that. And the best part about it is that's when Harper Collins looked up and said, hey, I think we've got a good book here. So they signed Mark. 
Next is Babette Papage. Close enough. How do I pronounce it? That's close enough. Close enough. That's Babette Close Enough. And she's a multimedia producer with more than a decade of experiencing, uh, experience creating trend-setting network television programming. She launched a multi-webby honored Bakespace.com in 2006 as the web's first food social network. She then dem democratized cookbook publishing with cookbookcafe.com. Uh, this is the first DIY, DIY platform that lets anybody publish and sell a cookbook as an ebook or an iPad app. So pretty much that's democracy to publishing, because let's face it, everybody has a cookbook in their heads, but putting it down and selling it is where the magic happens. She also created the Tech Munch Food Blogger Conference, and the interesting thing on Bakespace is that enables brands to engage with consumers on a peer-to-peer -peer level. Um, past partnerships, I know KitchenAid for one, uh, Reynolds, Sara Lee, McCormick, Kodak, ABC, Universal, Fox Searchlight, and Overture Films, and currently she's running promotions for Desperate Housewives, Grey's Anatomy, Ugly Betty, and Pushing Daisies. There's a lady who's turned... How old is that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I dug deep to get all this. I really did. Um, we know Nolan Bushnell. Well, he really doesn't need an introduction, but do you know that he founded Atari in 1972 with only $500? Yes. In 1975, he made an agreement with Sears to sell a home version of Pong, right? In 1976, you sold Atari to Time Warner for $28 million. And by 1982, Time Warner's Atari division was making $2 billion a year. All from your original idea. I really screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, the, uh, I take $28 million. That's not bad. Good start. And who can forget Chuck E. Cheese? Right? You've all been to Chuck E. Cheese. Pitchers of beer and great games. But Nolan has been inducted into the Video Game Hall of Fame, duh. The Consumer Electronics Show <laughs> Hall of Fame, and named as one of Newsweek's 50 Men Who Changed America. To date, he's founded more than 20 companies. Currently, he's on the board of Anti-Aging Games and an educational software company called Brain Rush that uses video game technology in educational software. So, I mean, this man doesn't stop. And that's the thing, as you guys get older and you develop in your careers, don't stop, keep thinking, keep doing, be creative. And at the end is Tim Sanders. He's the CEO of Los Angeles NetMinds and founder of research firm Deeper Media Incorporated. Uh, prior to this, guess what? He was chief solutions officer at Yahoo uh, as well as leadership coach from 2001 to 2005. He's a strategic consultant to leading brands, associations, and government agencies, and also he's the author of four books, global bestseller, Love is the Killer App, How to Win Business and Influence Friends, The Likeability Factor, and Today We Are Rich. So I know the introduction was a little long, but you've got to admit these people are interesting, right? I'd like to pass the microphone over to Jeffrey. And the first thing I'd like to ask everybody is, what made you want to write that first book? Or get into publishing. Or get into publishing, she said. Um, <laughs> for myself, um, much like Nolan, I've uh, had my ups and downs. And uh, my, my first company was a thing called Palaces, as was mentioned earlier. Um, that grew to like 10 million users at its peak. And we sold it, which was great. And then I did one after it, which you didn't hear about tonight, called uh, Super City. And that was, uh, I won't get into what it was, but long story short is I raised $2.3 million uh, in 99. Uh, by 2001, that was all gone, and there was no way to raise money. So, um, so at that point, um, I, and I pretty much lost all my palace money and all that, and I was uh, up against the wall, and, but suddenly I had a lot of free time. And, uh, and I had really always wanted to write fiction. Uh, and I just sort of said, well, well, I'm screwed. I might as well go do it now. I got plenty of time. So, um, so I, I started working on it in secret and didn't tell anyone what I was doing. And uh, until I was, it took me about a year and a half or so to finish the first draft. And uh, when it was done, I was like, yeah, this is, this is pretty good. I think I'm proud of this. I think I'll share this with the world. And, um, 
and so that, that, that was really the impetus of it. And, uh, and then I got into, and I was trying to figure out, well, now how do I break it out into the world? How do I get it published? And I really had no idea how to do that. And, uh, but I started thinking like a startup guy, because that was what I knew. And I said, you know, I'm going to treat this like a little mini, you know, like a little mini internet startup, um, which at the time was sort of an, a new idea. I think a lot of people weren't doing that. Um, but there were really three of us who were the first people in the world to podcast our novels. And uh, this was in 2004, 2005, right when uh, it was becoming popular. And uh, because we sort of rode the tech wave, when iTunes came out with podcast support, we rode that all the way up. And uh, that was part of how all of us uh, got very big numbers, uh, in my case, 2.5 million. So. Tell us about... Babette, tell us a little bit about Bake Space, which is really your sure. baby and what founded your little empire. Well, I feel kind of um, I feel kind of small because I've never produced a book. Uh, so all these authors, I, I applaud you because Wait, I, I think I I do I do enable publishers. Um, I had started working. I created a site called Bakespace.com in 2006. And around like 2008, 2009, Facebook started really taking off and everyone started going there. And I looked at my company that I built and I realized I needed to start thinking about our users as not just members and community, but also people who, who um, could spend money. And the, the idea really didn't come to me for quite some time. And then around 2011, which I know seems like a long time ago, um, it hit me. We started working with a lot of nonprofits. They were having trouble fundraising, scaling their fundraising. I started working with a lot of food bloggers who wanted to monetize their content. And then I realized that I have members who wanted to buy cookbooks and if I could get the food bloggers to create cookbooks and I can get the nonprofits to use a cookbook platform to fundraise and scale their fundraising I thought ah I could combine all the two and I already have this great community what do I do with it now so instead of closing the company down or instead of pivoting so far that I don't even know what the company is, I decided to add on to something and I decided to add on a layer of publishing. Our first initial publishing was recipes where it was a recipe swap was the format of the site and we started working with a lot of brands and that gave us a lot of opportunity where we didn't have to go out and look for funding. I was already getting sponsored by like ABC, Sara Lee, a lot of people wanted to do branded content. You may know it now as native advertising, uh, but that's been around for a really long time. It's just a really cool name now, which I like because you can charge a premium for that. Um, and so then we started working with a lot of brands doing cookbook publishing. So I think the real inspiration for me, the moment that I realized what I had to build was this platform, was I was on a plane, and I was, you know how you never listen to that person who's like, you know, she, the stewardess is like, make sure you put your mask on yourself and then put on your child. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't I want to protect my child? I don't even have a child, but I thought if I did have a child, I'd protect my child. And then I realized it hit me, you have to build something that m will help more people than what you can do on your own. And so I was working with a lot of nonprofits, making donations, trying to save dogs on Facebook. If anyone follows me on Facebook, you know I'm a huge animal advocate. And I realized at that point, save your money, and build something that can help a lot more people. So that was really the inspiration for building the entire platform. Um, and that's basically it. And how are those books selling now? Actually, they're doing pretty well. Um, we have paid paid content, and we also have a lot of free content. A lot of our like established authors use uh, mini cookbooks to uh, build buzz before their real cookbook comes out, because it takes two years to publish a cookbook. It's as everyone knows in publishing, it can take a long time. So they're, lo they're finding really cute, cute and innovative ways to use the platform. It has video, it has social links that open up within the app. Um, and also, the for just so you guys know, the format of the app is like a giant cookbook. It's a smart cookbook. So every time you download a cookbook, it becomes part of a global indexing system. So your recipes that are from the brands or from you know, a nonprofit, Instead of me having to go to the nonprofits page and look for that cookbook, all I do is search for chocolate chip cookie recipes and any cookbook that has that type of recipes gets filtered for me. So 
it becomes a reader. So the platform becomes a very useful utility. It's not just, oh, I'm publishing this and come and check this out. It's, you want chocolate chip cookie recipes. I have this in this cookbook. Please download this. And hopefully it's for a good cause at the same time. Exactly. Nolan, is this your first book? It is. Well, it's the first it's the first book that I published. I actually have written three books. Yeah, I know, the sex book. Well, sex no. in space. It's, I know sci it's science fiction. I want to read that one. Erotic. <laughs> it's, it's science fiction for nerds with, and, and sex. But anyway, no. <laughs> I don't, I, I actually, and then I did one on education. It's called Hyper Ed School of the Future, and it's sort of my idea of how we should I've started all this brain science on how, how people learn. And it turns out that everything that we're doing currently is wrong. Everything. Fine. And, and that, that the way we learn is actually more like the way we play video games. And that in our, in our alpha test software, we are teaching kids 10 times faster than the classroom. 10 minutes a day, uh, three days a week, kids in Spanish one end up with a 1,500 word working vocabulary. Without our software, they end up with 150 words, maybe. I believe that once we're fully deployed, we will be able to teach a complete academic year uh, a full academic four years of high school in less than six months and spend all the rest of the time teaching creativity and entrepreneurship and all the stuff that really matters. Well, but this book, the book that you have right there. Oh, I'm sorry. I got The one you're holding up. I, <laughs> <laughs> what made you write this, aside from what Tim did? That book had to live within you because that's the, what, what happens with an author. What made you want to write it? First of all, I'm a good storyteller and a crappy writer. I almost flunked out of freshman English when I was in college. I would have never gotten any kind of a grade on any of my papers if I hadn't had it corrected by a wife or girlfriend. So understand that I, I can't spell. My grammar is horrible in writing. I think I talk okay, but, <laughs> but um, and so, what, I, what Tim got for me was a really wonderful ghost, a guy named Gene Stone, who was a brilliant man. And I told him stories, and he told my story in, a, in an eloquent way. I mean, this is so much better than anything I could create, you know? And it's kind of like talking to you over coffee, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a thing where I, I wrote the story, and then he read it, and he said, Okay, let's fix this. And 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 then he yelled at me every day for a few weeks to tell him more stories. And so there are more stories in here than I thought I knew. Some would say I made some up, but I didn't. <laughs> well, Tim, since I, I know you've written books, but what Nolan just said gives me a question for you. What that editor or ghostwriter did was very important for Nolan. Because a writer can't just be raw rod by the editors. There has to be a lot of critical commentary on their writing. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about how NetMinds does that. So, so I want to talk a little bit about ghostwriting first. So Gene Stone, who was the writer on this book with Nolan, he wrote Forks Over Knives, which some of you might have read. He was the author of that book. He was, and I'm going to get in trouble with Blake for saying this, but he wrote Start Something That Matters with Blake Mikoski. Um, and I could name a bunch of other books you probably heard of that he's behind. Um, he's different than your typical, what I call, vanity press ghostwriter. So a vanity press ghostwriter spends a long weekend with you and does all the work, and the book barely resembles the author. And I'm not a fan of that. Nolan's not a fan of that. Gene doesn't do that. Gene is a writer. Nolan and I are authors. In the world of nonfiction, the two aren't necessarily the same. They don't have to be. An author owns the intellectual property and the life experience. No one knows this but the author. The writer 
delivers it to the reader. I kind of think of it like an idea person in a startup versus the designer and the coder that actually delivers the vision to the user. So um, at NetMinds, what we did is we, at the time, were doing minimum viable lean startup style. So we had about a dozen authors like Nolan, about 500 freelancers like Gene, and I would literally just put a list out by email, and they'd all respond to the book they wanted to work on. And we created a bunch of Skype or recorded conversations to create notes for the programmers about how negotiations work. And Nolan fell right into this. So can I share your deal with Gene? Are you okay with this? So. So we gave Nolan 90% um, of the equity of the book to start. So we're like an agent. That's what I'm like, a literary agent, right? Um, he gave Gene 30%, no money down. Gene usually gets like $100,000 or more to ghostwrite a book because it takes six months of your life. But Gene loved the book, and they became friends. And so Gene is now a serious angel investor in the book. And you know, he got a designer. For those of you that have read Seth Godin's books with the Domino Project, so all the books were designed by a young man from Brooklyn named Alex Miles Younger. If you read the Stephen Pressfield book, like Do the Work, or you saw the... Anyway, he did all those covers, and he came in, and he did a serious discount on his fee and took a few points in the back end, and that was the NetMinds model that emerged. And for those of you that are saying that it's just plagiarizing the old movie studio model for indie films, you're absolutely correct. That's exactly what it is. It's a complete ripoff of L.A. movie making. So. But, Tim, is everybody good enough to do a book? I mean... NetMinds can't... Not everybody's good enough to do a Tumblr, but they do it anyway, so... Um, but somebody has to buy the book in the end. Well, somebody has to read the book. I, I think, I think in, in, in the future, we will express ourselves with long-form content instead of short-form content because we'll be able to build teams to deliver that, and it may be the way our kids understand our perspective on life. It may be the way people that join our company understand the values of a company, like what Tony Shea did, do a ghostwriter, with Delivering Happiness, which is now an orientation book you get when you start working at the company. So to answer your question, Marcia, no. Not everybody should write a book, but I borrowed this from Nolan. Um, things like NetMinds or even Kickstarter, it's a meritocracy. If your idea is banal and you can't deliver it, it's just going to be crickets and nothing's going to happen. Exactly. Um, so I, th I think the beauty of digital is it takes care of itself. So, so I was going to answer the question about why I wrote a book because I think that yeah, my experience is very unique. Too, yeah. So I, I never intended to write a book. I, 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 my wife and I were in a band. And I was making trip hop music. This is in the 90s. I was working for Mark Cuban at what was AudioNet. It had just become broadcast.com. Cuban heard the band play and said we weren't good enough, and we had an IPO coming, so he gave me kind of a fork in the road choice, and I chose the IPO and never played another gig, and he told me something would come along later. And what came along later was a chance to make a sales presentation to a guy named Tom Peters, who had come to broadcast.com to consider video streaming of all of his speeches so he wouldn't have to tour, and the sales guy got stage fright and couldn't present to Tom Peters, the famous presenter. I, as like a rocker sales guy, did not know who in the world Tom Peters was. I had no idea who this joker was, but I knew about the future of the internet, so I gave him a two-hour whiteboard thing. And at the end of it, he says, son, do you believe in free speech? And I said, absolutely, sir, I'm a flaming liberal. And he said, um, great, then come to Atlanta with me. I need an opening act that can freshen up this crowd. So I went out. Cuban was like, free advertising, go. So I went to Atlanta with him, and I gave like a 10-minute talk about, this is like, I would say 1999 at the time, about viral marketing. And the, na the idea that ideas were biological and what the internet was going to do was going to allow what we now call memes to travel on their own with very little propulsion required. And this literary agent who had come to talk to Tom Peters, her name is Jan Miller, she saw me give that talk, and she came up to me afterwards and said, you need to write a book. And I said, I don't know, I have time, I don't have a book in me, I'm not a writer. And she says, look, I, I, I think we can go to New York, we can get you a book deal, and it'll really help you, Yahoo had just bought us, it's gonna make a big deal to you in your career, and that's where it started. And much like Nolan, the ideas I had for a book were wrong. I was writing books that weren't about me in my experience. They were about things I cared exactly. about. Exactly, so. and I think this is something we need people to understand, to write what you know, write what, you're, what you feel in your soul and what you understand. Otherwise That's right. Otherwise it'll be disingenuous to the audience. And, and this is what Jan Miller taught me, and th this is what I really talk to authors a lot about. Your book has to work. It has to have an effect on the reader. 
that causes the reader to tell everyone she knows to read your book. There is no marketing campaign, no social media blitz. There is no PR stunt you can do that will make a book that doesn't work be successful. Marketing just puts a quantity of books in the hands of beta readers, and if it's a great book, it sales. And what she taught me is that if you want to write a book that works, write a book that can only be written by you. And that's where Love is the Killer app came from. I had a bunch of dumb ideas that I thought were great because they had markets, I had an interest in them, I was writing a lot of pages on them, and finally she sat down and said, tell me your story. You know, tell me how you became Chief Solutions Officer. You were a sales guy three years ago that played in a band on the weekends. How, how did this happen? And I talked to her about a networking program I had with every business person I met, and from that came the book because that was a, a genuine idea. Well, it's funny you And say that's that where it came from. Because when I first wrote eBay for Dummies, you know the For Dummies brand was like it. It was the cool deal. And authors wanted to write for dummies. But I wasn't an author. I was somebody who had a passion for what I was doing with a writing background. So from day one, I put my email address in my books. I started building a community in the late 90s. I had 10,000 people I was emailing on an email list to. And whether dummy, for dummies liked it or not, all of a sudden, Marsha Collier was the person they needed to write the next edition of the book. So I kind of leveraged their brand which helped me, and that made a big difference. And yeah. I might have leveraged Yahoo's brand, just a skosh. Um, <laughs> just a skosh. You can imagine in 02 when the book dropped, um, Yahoo was, you know, like Facebook circa 2009, so um, definitely. Well, you know, Mark Jeffrey is leveraging something called Wattpad with 17.5 billion reading minutes a month of engagement. Tell, yeah, talk sure. a little bit about that and what you're doing with Goodreads. Yes, yeah, so um, so as Tim says, with marketing is a more, it's a, for, it's a it's a force multiplier. It's not going to take the place of there being no there there. If there's no force to multiply to begin with, you know the for, you can have the best force multiplier in the world and it won't help you. That has been said. Um, if you've got something great, you still have to find a way to rise up out of the noise. Um, and increasingly, as self-publishing becomes more popular, um, there are a lot of people coming up, you know, flooding the market with all kinds of stuff, and a lot of it's not that good. That having been said, there are some really good things in there um, that just haven't found a way up and out of it. Um, and so what I've done, I've done it four times now, is because of my technology and internet uh, company background, um, I've gotten ahead of the technology curve with my writing. Um, so I told you already about how I did that with podcasting. I use podcasting to pop ahead of the curve and, and jump up and down and say, hey, look at my book. Um, the things that are happening right now that are like that, um, so where the puck is going, um, there, there's really three things I want to talk about. One of them is Wattpad. Um, Wattpad is a site you may or may not have heard of because it's out of Canada. It. Yes, Watt, W-A-T-T-P-A-D. Um, they just recently raised about $17 million from Kosla Ventures. For those of you who don't know, Vinod Kosla is one of the world's most well-known venture capitalists um, who put that money in there. Um, coincidentally, they have 17.5, almost the same amount, <laughs> billion reading minutes of engagement a month uh, spent reading Wattpad. That's how they're me measuring it. You know, people are reading and being measured oh. by the minute. Well, I should tell you what Wattpad is. So Wattpad is like, um, it, it's like YouTube, but for fiction. So you upload your text onto Wattpad, and you don't make any money. There's no way to make money. It's not like Kindle Direct Publishing. But you can build a very large audience very quickly on Wattpad. Um, and uh, I've put one of my novellas up there for free, um, a steampunk thing called Age of Aether. Um, the reason I do that is because I got 120,000 uh, reads of it, which is driving traffic to my four pay novels up on Amazon. So you put a little loss later up there. That's, you know, Wattpad is one definite great place to get traffic very fast. Giving readers a free taste always works. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, this sold for 99 cents. It was a couple of pages out of my book. And boy, did this generate sales. You just have to give readers a taste of the book. And what are you doing at Goodreads? Because that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, so Goodreads, as you might or might not know, got acquired by Amazon for some ungodly, like $150 million, something like that. Um, and it actually started here in LA, not too far from this office. Actually, it was the first office of Goodreads. Otis, Otis Chandler is behind it. Um, Goodreads is a site, it's a social network for authors. 
or sorry, for readers. Um, but there's a lot of authors on there engaging with their audience. I have far more reviews on Goodreads than I do on Amazon or any other place. You know, and I find it interesting because I know you guys, and we'll get to that in a second, integrate through Facebook with readers. And I know you have a platform on Goodreads. Yes. I, I still get email from people in Billings, Montana who read my book, you know, and it's my own community, or it's their community, and I'm just part of it. And it kind of floats all over the internet, which is really kind of cool. Yeah, there was one other, I just want to yes. mention Glossy really quickly. So, oh, Glossy, yeah, yeah. yes, because this is <laughs> brilliant. So one of the things that happened over the last year, or last year and a half or so, I basically do two things. I write novels, as you've heard, um, but I also consult for local companies, both on the technology and product side, mostly. Um, and one of the companies I was brought in by the board to help out um, was, was sort of a turnaround company. And what we ended up coming up with was a product called Glossy, which is a way for anyone to make magazines. Um, G-L-O-S-S-I. So Glossy with an I. And um, the thing that's really awesome about that is if, you, if you're familiar with something like iBooks Author or InDesign, um, these, these, these really sort of somewhat difficult programs that you have to download and use to design really well laid out pages for you know, magazines, but also textbooks or, um, or really well illustrated novels or that sort of thing. These, I mean, these programs are kind of not um, accessible to uh, people who don't know how to design like it's me. Really it's like your own <laughs> flipbook kind of yeah, it's, thing. Yeah, except gorgeous. it's you can you can do anything you want. There's no sort of you're not boxed into any sort of format. So and you can publish it directly to the tablet immediately. And so I, I pretty much made a toy for myself. This yeah. is sort of what happened in the last year or so. And um, we've had people. You know, Margaret Atwood is using it now. Um, it's all over the map. As long as as long as he's on a rant here. Um, I want you to tell me about Scriblio Tech because this is ah. something I am fascinated with. And I, Tim, do you know about Scriblio Tech? Listen to this. This is a new Brilliant. company. You probably wouldn't have heard of it yet. You'd love um, it. So the idea behind it is that it's crowdsourced pricing. So as so the, not, everything starts off for free. Well, it doesn't have to, but typically. Yeah. Um, and and as people start downloading it, the book starts going up in price. And as it gets more popular, you know, the author starts making more money. And as it drops off, same thing happens. The price starts dropping again. So every book is like it's, it's like a stock. And Supply and demand. Exactly. So they've got a patent on this. Um, they're going to be launching it with a major, uh, I can't say who, um, but book provider uh, by the end of the year. So, so for, for the nerds out there, that kind of gives the concept of decay a very unique meaning, you know, separate from how we think about like edge rank. That's interesting, yeah. you know? Yeah. That, well, what that really says is quality content. You know, we've all heard content is king, right? Those, the experts, they love to say that all the time. Content is king. It's not really true. Good content is king. And how much have you read on the internet that is just a rehashed version of something you've read somewhere else or somebody else's tips? If you want to generate good content, you've got to be creative. You've got to come up with some new ideas, or at least a new way to put it, a new twist on something. But that, about that, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned one point, and that was about different social platforms to repurpose or sample book content. You want to tell a little more about that? Um, you mean repurpose our members' books or repurpose? Yeah, I mean, for example, say a book has, uh, takes place in the South or has a special peach tree as a main character or something like that. I'm like thinking, what did I write? I must have been... The author could create a cookbook with the book trailer <laughs> and peach recipes oh. from the South. To ah, okay, okay, I see what you're okay. saying. Okay, I was actually thinking, I was going more along the lines of, I just uh, spoke at a panel this weekend talking about repurposing Google Hangouts in, in, uh, in some of our cookbooks. So that's where I thought you were actually going there. Um, there's, you know, lots of people don't think food is something that they can relate to. You know, obviously everyone eats, but you think if your content is not food, then it doesn't really apply to a cookbook. Um, we just did a campaign with Disney for the new Tinkerbell movie, and that has really no food in it. Like, in the movie, there is no food. Tinkerbell, like, magically is always skinny, and she never eats. And she's adorable, and we love her. Um, but they wanted to reach out to moms and kids. And what better way 
to get mom and the kid in the kitchen is to supply some really like Disney theme recipes. Um, and they wanted to kind of kick it up a notch. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going off a little bit on a tangent here, but it's an interesting story. Um, as long as it's interesting. So the first cookbook we made with them was was their content. So we created six or seven recipes. We put it into the um, into a cookbook. We put the trailer from the show. Um, that allowed them to repurpose content they already invested in without having to do much expense. It was pretty much an ad buy. Then the second cookbook was even more brilliant. Uh, we actually curated recipes from their fans. And we have a, a proprietary group uh, cookbook collaboration tool where people can just send out a link and if you add your recipe on that link, it automatically goes to that cookbook. So it allows groups to create massive cookbooks very quickly. Um, so their second cookbook was really not only getting their community involved, but it was actually turning their community into marketers and getting them to reach out to their community. So as you can tell, that's probably a very inexpensive way to share the message in a useful way. Recipes have always been a really interesting ad delivery platform. If you've looked at any magazines, you will see, you know, even with, I don't know, there's, Velveeta. So yeah, there's, the well, I just saw, we have this in our deck right now, we're going for a round of funding, and I have a picture of, what's the, the vampire movie? It's like Twilight. famous, Twilight. The guy from Twilight has a recipe, I'm like, are you kidding? A recipe from the guy from Twilight is basically like in Better Homes and Gardens, and that is attracting a certain demographic, it's giving women, men, whoever likes that movie, something of use. And that's the trend now in a lot of content is it's not just supplying information, especially in the food space, it's also giving something that's useful as well. So they're repurposing a lot of this content that they already have. Um, bloggers are doing that with their blogs where they're basically repurposing old recipes that they've had before and repackaging it into cookbooks. Um, and then also we're repurposing Google Hangouts. We have like 450,000 followers on Google Plus, and we do a show where we feature one of our cookbook authors, then we take that video and put it into their cookbook so then people can see how that cookbook was made. So there's ways to repurpose content that is not necessarily, you know, you may not have made it for that cookbook originally, but there's ways to, to add. That's what, what technology what about, is doing now. What about things like food allergies and that? Can you search on food allergies? Absolutely. You can search on food allergies. It's contextually um, searchable. So it's not just searching category or the title, but if anyone says like, my son's allergy, blah, 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 whatever, that if that word is in the description, it will pick it up in our search as well. Yeah, and you can then um, sort by specific, like people can actually add it to no, that category. No, no garlic for the twilight. Okay. <laughs> that's true, that's true. But sex every 30 pages, so they're all over that. <laughs> Nolan, I wanted to ask you, risk and reward. You've had some brilliant ideas in your life. You've taken a lot of risks. Where do you place the balance? And then I'm gonna take that to Tim too about writing. Oh, it's all about having fun. You know, I mean, trust me, guys, you, it's such an adventure. Life is such a cornucopia of weird shit going on all the time. And most poor sons of bitches are starving to death, right? Exactly. <laughs> Remember, yeah, Andy Mame, right? That's right. Yeah, and, and, and I think that my, my next book is going to be about how do you build your brain? How do you build your personal creativity? And I've been doing this crazy thing lately about change and random change and unexpected change. And it has really added extra spice to a, a pretty interesting life so far. And think about writing down 11 things half of which you don't want to do, half of which you don't think you can do, and then, but they all have to be things you can do in a year. In January 1, you throw the dice, and you have to do what the dice tells you. There was an interesting, weird book in the 60s about the dice man, and it's really about how to have an interesting life that isn't boring. But what I found out that it's really about 
how do you build your brain? The more different things that you do, the higher your IQ and the more creative you are. Just do different things. You've got great examples right here. I mean, look at these two people, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I, I trumbled, stumbled on this through doing a lot of the research for my education companies. And I just, all, and, and I always experiment on myself. And it has been a real game changer for me. Get rid of your habits. You have habits that you don't even know you have that are destroying your brain cells. Get better. <laughs> That's great. Such deep thoughts, really, Nolan. It's amazing. Well, no, just weird stuff. Okay, but now I want to ask Tim something a little more concrete. And that's the risk reward of sharing that risk reward with a publisher. And how do you think people can publish smarter? So um, I think the greatest risk in writing is doing it on your own. I agree. I think that the success stories of E.L. James and a variety of other folks have duped people into believing they're editors too. And um, I believe if if it wasn't for Maxwell Perkins at Scribner, F. Scott Fitzgerald would have written the meh Gatsby because his draft sucked. <laughs> it was about 1,700 pages of dribble. It was a really broken plot. It had no ending. There's a great book uh, about Maxwell Perkins. It's called Editors on Editing, which introduces this idea. But I think the greatest risk you have is doing this on your own. And I think the way to publish smarter is to include more people, be true to your vision, and look for the geniuses in the pile that are helping you to reshape this into something great. And I experienced this, and to bring this to social media, in 2009, I was writing Today We Are Rich, my fourth book, and I started an experiment I became very addicted to. It was with my Facebook page. I had about 2,000 people on the page, and what I would do is, every time I had an idea, it could just be a sentence or it could be a paragraph of a concept of the book, I'd put it on Facebook and then I'd study metrics of engagement against it. And every once in a while I'd try it on Twitter, but Twitter didn't work as well as Facebook. Uh, for whatever reason, people on Facebook are more organic with you on interacting as opposed to Twitter where they're trying to build following. It's a different dynamic altogether, at least it was in 2009. And we and literally... Now it's going the other direction. Yeah, well we literally figured it out where you could see the difference between a good idea and a mediocre idea because one would get 30 interactions and another would get two. And you could put them out at the same time of day, this is before paid promotion, same number, and it was as clear as the nose on your face. And then I started to do more of this where I'd say, okay, I'm looking for a story about a person who had a real loss in their life, but they found a way instead of being hateful to help the person that hurt them. And an incredible story came out of my Facebook community um, that's in the book, if you've read it, uh, about a man who lost his five-year-old son um, in Costa Rica due to an accident, and he invested his life into helping the man that was responsible for it later, who was traumatized from the situation. It was a very touching story. Half my book came from my Facebook page. By the time the editors finished saying, I like this story, I like that story, the content of the book emerged from the crowd if you will. And at NetMinds, we've seen this happen over and over again. Bill Jensen wrote a book called Simplicity years ago. I loved it. Um, he is publishing his next book with NetMinds. It's called Disrupt. And it's about dealing with personal disruption in your life due to technology and change. And he used a Ning group as he wrote the book with 44 trusted people that he'd aggregated throughout his 15-year career that helped him keep the narrative on track so it was a surprising truth format book instead of a duh, you know, common sense book, which most authors write and those don't sell. He was calling the book Disrupt, Do Epic Shit which was based on an interview he did with Marissa Mayer as part of this book, because that's a Googleism, by the way. They say it all the time. You can Google it. There's actually a T-shirt for this. He used our Facebook page as well as his blog to ask people, should this be the title? And they corrected him. And he's doing a much better title now that's now going to be picked as one of the 30 best business books of the year by Soundview, who would not have touched it if it was still do epic shit. And that exactly. was interesting. So. And, and, you know, I find that rampant. Although we discuss and we use words, when you want to be selling to an audience, you don't want to just use to sell your publication or your book or your product to people who use the word shit. 
there is a good group of the population out there who doesn't say shit on a regular basis. Yeah, it's good for comedy, right? They, so so they shit may, my dad says works. Yeah, but, they you know, may not want it on the cover of a business book. Yeah. So it, it's and, playing to the audience. And to give you another idea, Brian Cuban, who's Mark Cuban's little brother, is doing a book with this called Shattered Image. And Are it's you about kidding? That's who he is? Yeah. I talk to him all the time. I yeah, Brian Cuban. <laughs> yeah. He's, Mark, he's Mark's younger brother who was bullied as a child. He um, developed uh, male body dysmorphia, which is a body image issue. Difference with men is instead of plastic surgery, they try to commit suicide. So it's a really traumatic situation for him. He used Facebook not to try out content because it was too personal didn't need people's reaction. He tried it for more basic stuff, like color schemes for the book. Which one of his PR pictures represented him better? And he got fantastic interaction and developed a following along the way. But one thing that he learned is that you never ask people to opine about a piece of manuscript that's either not edited or you know it's wrong because you're not gonna get valuable feedback. And so one of the things we've kind of learned through the NetMind's progress is, is that we have to be very careful in how we use collaborative tools to make sure we're talking to the right people, showing them the right prototype, and looking for the right metrics in their response so we can write a book that works. Well, interestingly, um, Mark and I were talking about a similar topic a little early, well, actually straight on that topic. I mean, I've got over two million books in people's homes, and I'm, that's great. God bless it. God bless America. And um, I love writing, but I couldn't do it without being beaten down by an editor. And a lot of people who write their own books, who think self-publishing is this, this creative thing that we're going to just write a book. Mark has been on both sides of the fence. So I wanted Mark to comment because I think budding authors need to hear the difference. Yeah, I hate to admit this, but uh, both of you guys are right. Um, I really, so I, when I first wrote um, the Max Quick, the Pocket and the Pendant, um, it was 97,000 words. Um, I thought it was awesome. <laughs> and it, a lot of it was good. I'm not going to, I mean, there was a core of something good there. Um, and and HarperCollins said yes and immediately assigned me an editor. And that was an extremely uh, humbling experience. Um, and it basically really sucked. It was just like getting pounded every day. And, but it uh, sucked, but it improved the book, right? Yeah, well, I'm getting there, but yes. Okay. The, the, it does have a happy ending. Okay. So, um, so the end result was a 55,000 uh, word book, so a lot more cl uh, compact. Um, and it really wasn't until the end, and I actually I'd had like a couple months worth of distance from it, that I went back and reread the, the finished manuscript from HarperCollins. I was like, holy crap, this is a lot better. Yeah. And I just, didn't, I just didn't realize how much better it was getting with that input. And it's just really extremely painful at the time. And then when you get to the other end and you have distance, then you understand why. And it really hurts. I'm in the middle of finishing edits on a book and the comments from my editor, I mean, I scream at the screen and say, don't you understand what I've said here? I understand, why don't you? Well, clearly, I haven't written it clear enough. And that is why, if you want to self-publish, partner with somebody, hire yeah. an editor. Yeah. I know on Twitter there are a bunch of editors that are out there who are willing to work by the hour, work by the project, or go to a company like uh, Tim's company at NetMinds. Don't try to do this yourself. Can, can I add something, too? Sure. So, so there's a different writing process available to you. Many of you, if you're thinking of writing a book, is it nonfiction? Is it business? Is it marketing? Is it technology? Is it something there? In, in nonfiction categories, I recommend getting a partner who works with you on moving through your outline and they schedule a call with you. And this is exactly how Love is the Killer App was written with Gene. It's exactly how your book was written. You figure out your roadmap and then you schedule calls. And the calls are conversational, where you're answering questions to your editor about what you mean by this point, and they dig a little bit, right? And you record it, and you send it off to a transcription service. When I started, transcription was really expensive. Now it's dirt cheap because of startups like Rev.com, R-E-V.com. You can get an hour-long conversation transcribed for 60 bucks, okay? That's about 7,000 words just to give you an idea. So if you have 12 of those conversations, you can have almost 100K, and an editor can shape it, and when they give you back a document, it's you. And it's your words, and your vernacular, and your style, it's just been turned into something that the user can consume. I think that's an interesting way to think about collaboration, because as Seth Godin taught me a long time ago, people don't get talker's block, they get writer's <laughs> block. And 
you can always tell a really bad, badly organized collaborative scenario for a business book because what happened was is the author was writing it on a plane on his laptop and the whole thing is this medic medicine-y type, delete, type, delete, type, delete, save kind of process and that's not how you write books. That's how you write like Barticles, which is a book that should have been an article. Yeah, book writing is painful. It, book writing can be very painful. It's... I was going to mention one other thing though. The thing about Tim's program is there's marketing, you know, PR. And in the blogosphere, I think some of you here should be part of a, of a book team because you understand social media to a high level. And a good social media wrangler should be part of a book team. And so I, you know, I think that that uh, you should look at this as an additional opportunity to show your greatness and to monetize it through getting a share of the royalties just by helping to promote a book. But the bottom line, like any good social media, you have to believe in the project. If you exactly. don't feel it in your soul, yeah. you're disingenuous. And whether it's Bake Space with recipes or Mark, I mean, everybody believes in what they're doing. You can't just say, I'm going to write a book because I'm going to get a lot of speaking gigs. That doesn't work. I did mine myself, School of Hard Knocks. I was lucky enough to get that first contract, but I clawed and scraped and kept going. And that's a lot of what it takes, is clawing and scraping and keep going and keep writing and getting beaten down by editors. So I just want to go to our panel and have everybody give a last comment to close out the session, although we could probably go all night the way it sounds. I mean, we've got some great content here. Mark, what's your last, last note? Um, just playing off something Tim said. Um, so this is the second Max Quick book, and as you can see, it's gotten a lot larger. Um, this is about the same size as one of the volumes in The Lord of the Rings. It's about 180,000 words, so it's pretty big. And um, I, as well, I love this. I sort of vanished for like a year while I wrote it. Um, after I sold my third company and things were very good and I didn't have to work for a little while and it was, it was time to play for a bit. Um, that having been said, if I were going to do something like this again, I would put it out in installments. I would put it out, you know, a couple chapters for 99 cents on the Kindle, see what the reaction is. Can't you still do that? No, I can, absolutely. Okay. But, well, I, but I guess what I'm saying is while I'm still writing it. So in, instead of like taking a year to produce this, do the first part of the book. I would plan the book out so I knew where I was Don't going. Don't tell but. my publisher, but as I've been working on this book, I've been making separate file copies and doing blog posts straight yeah. from the book. <laughs> I like the idea of getting feedback a lot earlier and then tightening those loops up. So um, that's my final thought. And should we say our websites now or later? Oh, please, oh. Mark, your website. So I'm at markjeffrey.biz, B-I-Z. And he does consultations with you smart people out there who might want to write a book or have a startup idea. Mark at markjeffrey.biz. Hello, everyone. I've been listening to the panel. Um, I, uh, I am the kind of person who um, I, I do not wait for feedback, usually, which I'm like the complete opposite of, I, I don't know, I have an entrepreneurial spirit and I try to put it up as fast as possible because in my mind, the faster I put it up, the faster I get feedback, the less time that I spend building something that may I don't know where it's going. Um, but I'm not talking about a book, obviously. But when, we are uh, when I am working with authors who are trying to write cookbooks, or I'm working with brands who are trying to reach consumers, or nonprofits who are trying to fundraise, um, the one thing I notice is that the faster that they start building their cookbook and start adding recipes and getting excited, that momentum starts to build, and their community gets very excited. So. Have you ever done something where you started something and you told a whole bunch of people and they're like, every time you saw them, they're like, hey, how's that thing going? You're like, great, great, great. And then like four months later, you haven't done anything. Just people stop asking you what you're doing. You so, get really boring when all you have is words and no action. Exactly. So when you're starting to build things or write things or go to platforms or whatever it is you're using, all those people who are getting excited because your enthusiasm is, is, is like at the highest 
point, you have to hit while that is hot. You have to move forward as fast as possible. Now, I'm with recipes, so obviously there are only so many chocolate chip cookie recipes in the world, let's be honest. But it's the stories of how that recipe, what it means to that person, or raising money for a nonprofit. A lot of those stories are just truly unique. So the only thing I want to, I guess, leave you with is, is that if you want to, there's tons of, I was going to say singles too, because there's tons of platforms that like allow you to do singles and smaller format chapter stuff. I think the podcasting thing, brilliant. Um, I, Google Hangouts, you could do like part of your book in a Google Hangout and it won't cost you anything. I mean, if you start building that kind of momentum, the people around you will come to your aid and they will cheer you on and they will give you the, the courage to complete it and go all the way to the end. Uh, and the more people you tell, the more you have to do it. So tell everyone what you're doing or else you're going to look like an idiot. Um, and so you can find me, I'm on Twitter, at Bakespace is my Twitter handle. Uh, Cookbook Cafe is the actual platform, all the marketing information. Cookbookcafe.com. Um, Cookbookcafe.com. And then Bakespace.com is sort of where people actually go to build the platform or go to build the cookbooks. Um, and we're on Google+. Plus. That's like right now our, our number one um, that's our baby right now because we're just producing every week. We do a new show um, every Thursday. I'm going to plug that now so you guys can tune in. Uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we do a show called Kitchen Party where we have an LA Times food editor, a Tampa Tribune food editor, myself, and we bring someone who's in the food world um, and we talk to them. We find out what they're working on. We find out if they're making cookbooks. So if you're in the, there's a ton of people doing that. If you're building something and you're getting ready to launch, there are people on Google Plus or any other platform who can help you promote that, who will invite you to come onto their show. So don't be afraid to ask some of these platforms like myself, hey, how can you help me promote this? Can we put it in your newsletter? Don't be afraid, because these are all startups. They all want Because everybody to needs content. If you're putting out a newsletter, you need stuff for that newsletter. If you're doing a podcast, people need people to interview. So everyone, when you go home tonight and you're thinking about that cookbook you're going to make, don't forget. Bakespace.com, <laughs> Babette. Nolan, what's your last, last note for the people? Uh, NolanBushnell.com, sort of my big Uber website that... Uh, was engineered by s some of my sons, which is kind of fun. I, I actually have eight children, which is, uh, eight? yeah. He's been busy. You know why he writes about sex all the time. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I'm not going, I'm not going there. Uh, anyway, five sons and, and, and three daughters, and uh, they are the best thing I've ever created. Um, and, uh, the my Twitter handle is at Nolan Bushnell, and I I tweet only brilliant things <laughs> in my mind, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I really have been enjoying this thing, um, and I'm going to be looking for somebody to help me social media uh, my book my science fiction book about sex every three pa 30, pages. 30 pages. So if, it, if you want to help me, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm anyway. I'm thinking there's a market for this. I, I'm thinking so. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, I'm actually going to be signing gift cards. This is a good thing. I've sold out of the book. Uh, I was going to bring a whole bunch of books, and I sold out. I, I, I went to Maker Fair yesterday. No, I was, it was Sunday, wasn't it? And... Uh, if you really want to feel good about tomorrow in the world, go to Maker Faire. There's just, the place is just a teeming swamp of creativity. It's so wonderful. From youth to what have you. Anyway, I sold out of my books, but, uh, so they have but I do have cards, cards here. Yeah, this is and so, and if you have your Kindle here, I will sign the screen. <laughs> You know, if, but I'll, I'll sign the card if, if you want to get one of my books for a Kindle. Great. Tim, what's your last bit of advice for, for those in the so audience? So it's hard to do just one, so I'll quickly bullet point three things quick. One, when you market a book, 
you have, we've learned in our data, you have five times more conversion if you get someone else to say buy his book instead of you say buy my book. And when I say buy his book, I say because I read it. So, so the key to marketing books online is to get other people with influence to read them. And just like Oprah does on her show, say I read it and you should too. Being mentioned as an expert does not sell books. Doing Skype interviews with people so they can get traffic to their blog does not sell books. Thank you very much. Okay. Jim. That's really important. That's no, critical. That's uber important. Just getting exposure doesn't sell you any books. Product usage and endorsement sells books because books are a used experience. It's very different than other things. Bronze that. That's yeah. So cool. the second thing I want to say to all of you is that if you're thinking of writing a book, there's three categories and one doesn't work well at all. Okay. The first category is called the surprising truth category. That's the surprising truth about whatever. It's unconventional wisdom like Freakonomics or Dan Pink's Drive. Very good selling book. People like to talk about those books. The second kind of book that sells is the validation book. You were right. You were successful because of your zaniness, not despite it. People will buy those books by the caseload, okay? The third kind of book is the helpful book that should be written, and you will struggle till the day you die writing those books because people buy them one at a time and it's a private experience. So I really want to share that because I've, I've really dissuaded a lot of authors from writing obvious books that are merely helpful for markets that are underserved. If you're going to spend that energy, for God's sakes, come out here to the beach and do a real startup, okay? Um, these, these cards are 10 bucks a piece and what they are is an ebook card. Our partner Bookshout, they're like the Goodreads for book communities. What it is is um, on the back is a scratch off code and you go to Bookshout, you get your ebook. You can download the Bookshout app on your iPhone, your Android, whatever, and it'll be waiting for you after you download it. Fantastic reading experience. When you comment, it goes on a structured conversation on bookshout.com around this book. So every single person that buys this, that reads the book and comments, automatically goes into a conversation that Nolan can moderate himself about the book which creates an addressable audience for the authors and a community conversation that just unleashes that Kindle experience you've had all along that you haven't figured out how to share individual notes. This is all automatic. I think it's super cool. We're selling these for 10 bucks a pop or three for 20. So if you want one, come grab me afterwards. Thanks a lot. I think that's great. And I want to thank our panel and buy everybody's books or read everybody's books. You know, now that there's more eBooks out there, and people are buying less paper books, what they are finding out now is that more people are reading because of convenience. And reading is a good thing. And it's great for the people in the country and it's great for everybody. So read, create, and join us hopefully next year. And to does somebody have a Sharpie? Them. Sharpie in the crowd, who's got a Sharpie? Does somebody have a Sharpie? Thank They're you gonna very donate. much, TechZulu, we appreciate it.